How do PSC clinical symptoms affect my quality of life? We have a slide to kick us off on this topic. You've already heard about the survey, and this is a summary slide from the survey. We will hear much more about the survey throughout the session today. But this first one really summarizes what concerns people the most. And we can see that the top ranking category is <clears throat> uncertainty. And this is uncertainty about the future because this disease uh, really is, is one that waxes and wanes over time. The problem is we don't really know when it will strike. And this unpredictability can be very, very distressing. And we will see that this is a recurrent theme throughout the day. So it's the uncertainty that really um, affects the quality of life so deeply for patients. Worries now or in the future, PSC symptoms, and we've already heard about many of them, loss of independence and ability to function independently, lack of understanding from society at large. When you talk about a liver disease, people often just assume that um, you did something to your liver and that that's why you're having these problems. The effects on social life, again, the unpredictability always rears its ugly head. And of course, also access to supportive treatment. So this brings us now to our first panel. This will be a panel talking about clinical symptoms. We will start off with Tim. Tim, please take it away. When I was diagnosed with PSC at 16, the most bothersome part was its negative impact on my social life, which took a toll on my emotional health as well. Shortly after being diagnosed, I was bullied for being different and for receiving special treatment. My peers and teachers couldn't really understand the impacts of having a chronic, progressive, and life-threatening illness. Back then, I had no idea what I was really in for until each new symptom appeared and became unbearable. And that's when I realized that it was the beginning of a long and painful struggle I was likely going to experience for the rest of my life. Now. After five years of living with PSC, I can confidently say that the worst symptom is the pain. And I've learned that pain isn't just physical, it's also how we feel emotionally about our lives. And every day I notice myself getting sicker and sicker. As my PSC really progressed, my quality of life also decreased significantly. In both my social and work life suffered. I'm awake at all hours of the night itching, and many days I'm so tired that after an eight hour nursing shift, I sit alone crying and eating and resting for the first time that day. There are even days when I'm not able to stand in the shower because I'm just too tired. I also have pain in my upper right quadrant, and that pain is so bad at night I get really irritated at myself for not being able to cope with it. It feels almost like a shark biting the side of my liver radiating to my back and shoulders. The emotional toll of this disease is completely devastating. It's knowing you have so much potential in life but you can't reach your goals or wishes because you're just too tired to get out of bed that day. It's when your partner asks if you'd like to go out for dinner and you burst into tears in the washroom while getting ready in fear he's going to leave you because you're just no fun. It's the effort you put towards looking and acting okay and unaffected, which is even more exhausting. It's having to walk away and set someone you love free so they don't have to pause their life for you. And it's being trapped inside a brain and body that no longer work together. The reality of this disease is its unpredictability, as we know. 
maybe today I can get up and wash the dishes or make a well-balanced dinner instead of eating a bowl of cereal or even feel like I got more than three hours of sleep. Maybe I'll be able to have more than one outing that day and that's something I now consider a daily win. But the worst is when the opposite happens and I can't do anything. And when my pain is so unbearable and severe that I take it out on my loved ones. And at those times, I become a mean and grumpy person to my family and I isolate myself away from my friends. The pain, which is chronic and doesn't improve with medication for me, makes me feel trapped in this progressively diseased body and is a constant reminder that I can't reach my full potential. This pain will always be a part of my life and it will never let me forget it. And that's why it's so important we work together to find symptom management tools for PSC pain. I would never, ever wish PSC pain on anyone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim, and I was diagnosed with PSC in 2001. I was told back then that I had five years to live. With three young children, my wife and I searched for a specialist. We found the Mayo Clinic, and were told it would likely be 10 years, if not more, and here we are almost 20 years later. At this time, I'm beginning the transplant process with a mound score of only 17, and severe symptoms. My primary symptom is unrelenting itching, which was described by another PSR as suicidal itch. I couldn't agree anymore. My itching is my great, greatest disability, beginning about a year ago and escalating for the last six months. It consumes me throughout my entire day with itching from my scalp to the bottom of my feet and all in between. There is no spot on my body that doesn't crave attention. It's at bedtime that it becomes almost unbearable. At night, when there are no distractions, my body unleashes an attack of itching so significant that I end up tearing up scabs previous, previously made and leaving blood stains on my pillows and sheets. I have been prescribed different itch medicine and after some relief, eventually get back to the same severity of itching. It is absolutely miserable. Once I'm in bed, I begin to itch until I fall asleep. My sleeping pill works pretty well for a short time. In my dreams, the itching may be light or strong and can, can keep me awake between two to four hours. It really sucks. Itching slows me down each morning as it interrupts every segment of my normal routine. Getting out of bed, brushing my teeth, getting dressed are all delayed due to the itching. Itching hurts. I itch so much, it feels like someone has taken sandpaper to my skin, which feels inflamed and raw. The more I itch my skin, the more it hurts. As I remove my clothes to go to bed, my body feels super heated, like I sat in the sun too long. <clears throat> Itching my scalp is very painful too. My eyes can hurt from the scratching I do. Which worries me is I had eyelid surgery two years ago requiring silicone slings to hold the eyelids in place. And I don't want to tear those slings with my itching. That would mean another surgery. Itching affects my family. My brother came down from New England recently to visit me and was shocked at how unrelenting the itch was. He couldn't believe that I scratched constantly throughout the day. My family feels badly too. They watch this miserable itch and there's nothing they can do to help. It pains them to see me have to go through this. 
It pains me, too, to see my friends that I've met over the years at our PSC conferences go through the itching that I am. Many have to deal with other issues like ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, bleeding varices, to name a few. And many, unfortunately, die either waiting for a transplant or from the complications of receiving one. We need help and we need it fast. Please consider everything you can for those of us contending with this awful disease. Thank you. When I say the word fatigue, people often relate it to being tired. But I promise you, it is not the same thing. PSC fatigue is like having a faulty battery that you put on a charger overnight. You never know if you're going to get a full charge, a half a charge, or maybe a dead battery the next morning. My name is Jessica, and when I was 22, I was diagnosed with PSC. Physically, it hits me like a ton of bricks. Have you ever felt so ill that you've had to stop what you were doing right then and there and just go straight to bed? Well, I have days like this on a regular basis. For me, fatigue causes headaches, severe nausea, lightheadedness, just to name a few of the symptoms. You know, even after having nine hours of sleep, sometimes I wake up with a dead battery. Even after a nap, a simple task like you know, emptying the dishwasher or folding my laundry, it'll send me right back to bed. PSC is a disease and PSC fatigue is a symptom are really hard to explain to other people because when you look at me, I don't look sick. I have lost track of how many family functions and social events that I've missed. If I do feel well enough to go, maybe you'll see me there laughing, smiling, chatting with people. But what you don't see is the amount of concentration it takes for me just to keep up with the conversation. Or when I stop in the middle of my sentences because I can't remember what I was going to say next. Or when I slur my words. When you have an invisible disease, people can't see what you're going through and they don't understand. One of the hardest things that I've ever had to do in my entire life was put my health first, even in front of my mother's whose was dying because of Parkinson's disease. My fatigue made this six hour trip there and back to visit impossible. And my visits never felt long enough. I can't tell you how difficult it was to leave and to see the tears rolling down her face after only being there for an hour. She passed away this December. And the loss is, is still incredibly difficult. Living with PSC and dealing with fatigue on a regular basis, it prevents me from working, from spending time with my friends and my family. And it prevents people from relying on me. This isn't the life of the person that I want to be. It's a life of a person that I'm forced to be. And I hope it doesn't have to be this way forever. You know, maybe one day somebody might be able to figure out a way to fix my faulty battery. I know that myself and others with PSC, we deserve to experience life to the fullest, but we need your help. My name is Elizabeth and I am 36 years old. I am a daughter, a sister, an aunt, a friend, 
and a pediatric nurse. I also happen to be a PSE patient, and I have been one since I was only one and a half years old. At that time, I suffered from bouts of severe diarrhea, feeding intolerance, and abdominal pain. Finally, at the age of nine, I received my diagnosis of PSC. At 13, it was autoimmune hepatitis. At 14, my life really began to change. School became harder. My retention seemed just slightly off. My health took a nosedive when I was 15. Due to missed school from being hospitalized, I had to have tutors. They noticed that recalling information from week to week began to really falter. I was no longer able to think critically like I used to. It was like living a hazy dream. Eventually, my tutors and my parents made the decision to pull me out of school completely as I could no longer complete my schoolwork. No matter how hard I worked, my retention and working memory were lost. I was only 15 when the basic right of school was taken away from me due to PSC. At this point, my life was on hold until I could be transplanted. My miracle happened when I was 16. I received the gift of life on July 3rd, 2000. After the transplant, I made it my mission to make up for lost time. I completed high school and went on to nursing school to achieve my dream. I was given the opportunity to fully embrace life and the challenges and rewards that come with it. During this time, over many conversations with my family, it was revealed that I have gaps in my memory from the years leading up to the transplant. Not only are memories cloudy, some are not even there. I don't remember helping to move my sister into college. I barely remember my Nana being diagnosed with cancer and losing her battle with it. When I search my memory from this time of my life, I have memories with no clear details or just complete blanks. At the age of 30, I was re-diagnosed with PSC. My world dropped out from beneath me and my thoughts immediately went to when the day would come again that my life would once again be on hold. What would happen when my mind would start to go again? I am a nurse. I need to be able to think clearly and critically at all times for patient safety. What happens when I am no longer able to support myself? Losing the mental acuity and no longer being able to be a productive and contributing member of society is what haunts me the most. The idea of losing my independence, it's my greatest fear. I can handle physical discomfort, but losing my mind, losing what makes me, me, is enough to make me crumble. I am here today to ask you to give me hope. Hope that another child will not lose parts of their childhood due to this disease. Hope that I and the rest of the PSC community will have the ability to live life fully and that we will have the ability to remember the memories that we make. I'm Dan McNamara and I'm a motion graphics artist living in Astoria, Queens but I'm moving to upstate New York. In 2008, I was diagnosed with PSC and ulcerative colitis after having my gallbladder removed. I started developing ulcerative colitis symptoms that couldn't be treated with just Lialda and had to start taking an immunosuppressant drug called 6MP. In 2009, I lost about 30 pounds. The frequent bathroom breaks at work took a toll on my job performance and I was laid off. The daily symptoms I was dealing with were frequent trips to the bathroom, stomach pain, lack of appetite, throwing up bile, severe fatigue, insomnia, and emotional distress. I spent several months in 2009 looking for work while dealing with the fatigue of PSC and ulcerative colitis. In 2010, I got a full-time job again and my ulcerative colitis was in remission with medication. Uh, but the PSC symptoms of severe fatigue, cirrhosis, 
vomiting, lack of appetite, stomach issues, sleeplessness, and brain fog deeply affected my quality of life and my mental health. My liver health declined so severely from 2010 to 2016 that I needed a liver transplant, and my wife asked for a divorce simultaneous to that. She wasn't interested in what was in store and was tired of dealing with my chronic illness. Over these years, I felt like I was slowly disintegrating. I was able to get a living donor transplant in 2017, and my fatigue went away. But after going off prednisone, I began developing issues with rosacea, and within the year, my UC flared since I was no longer taking anything for it. I was treated with prednisone and intivio, and I was able to get it under control, but I developed mild rejection of my liver and had to have frequent blood work. And the long-term use of prednisone made me develop skin issues and prednisone-induced diabetes. I'm 36, and since I was 24, I've had to have over 16 colonoscopies. I have a high chance of getting colon cancer and need yearly monitoring for the rest of my life. A liver transplant is currently the only cure for PSC, and it was a relief when I received a liver transplant. But not all the side effects and health issues have gone away. I'm still living in constant fear with unpredictability and feeling like life is a constant battle which has led to ongoing emotional distress and PTSD. I, I live in fear of recurrent PSC and ulcerative colitis. It's also hard to deal with the healthcare system. Since the transplant, I've hit my out-of-pocket max each year. And everyone I've ever spoken to who also has PSC has had different experiences, but they have all dealt with pain and mental health issues due to the disease. I wish there was more research done on my UC and PSC. I don't want to see people with this disease go bankrupt and live unfulfilling lives. They're all fighters and deserve the best. Thank you so much. Obviously, that was Afsana speaking first. Please forgive my error in the ordering, followed by Tim, Jessica, Elizabeth, and Dan. Thank you very much for those honest and intimate details of the effects of your PSC symptoms. As you've already heard from Ricky and Dr. Miller, in preparation for today's meeting, PSC partners conducted a survey to gather data on the PSC patient experience. In each of the five sessions today, a member of the PSC partners staff or board will present relevant results from this Our Voices survey we don't have enough time today to cover all of the survey results, but a thorough analysis will be included in the final Voice of the Patient report. Please welcome Joanne Hatchett, Medical Science Liaison for PSC Partners, to discuss some survey results. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and thank you to all of our guests who are here today, especially the FDA. We'll begin with this slide, which shows the responses to the question, when do you think your PSC symptoms began? The large red portion identifies that over 50% of PSC patients had symptoms before their diagnosis, yet about 20% said their symptoms began either near diagnosis or after diagnosis. This looks like an opportunity to better understand and respond to patient-reported symptoms. Is this an unmet need, which could benefit from more education for community physicians, especially those caring for patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, to be on alert for PSC symptoms, even in the absence of an elevated alkaline phosphatase level, which we know has great variability. With earlier PSC diagnosis, there could be a larger number of PSC patients available for trials, and many of these patients might be in an earlier stage of PSC. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the responses to the question, what impact did PSC symptoms have on how you felt or functioned when PSC was at its worst versus during the last six months. This slide is complicated, 
but we wanted you to see the number of symptoms PSCers endure. The red indicates major impact and the blue is minor impact. It's hard to see details, but as you look at overall picture, on the left, the percent of PSCers affected by these symptoms with PSC at its worst shows the top 14 symptoms affected more than 50% of PSC patients. These symptoms include fatigue, paritis itching, abdominal pain, liver pain under the ribs, nausea, insomnia, weakness, anxiety, depression, brain fog, and night sweats. The graph on the right represents the last six months, and we see most symptoms are still impacting about 50% of PSCers, although the impact is often described as minor. PSC fatigue in the top bar impacts over 75% of PSCers in the last six months. This demonstrates symptoms come and go. They can be intense and then disappear and then return with totally unpredictable patterns, which our speakers talked about uncertainty and unpredictability in their lives due to these factors. Future challenges include acknowledging symptoms, developing improved symptom management and determining clinical symptom endpoints for clinical trials. Next slide, please. In the past six months, what impact are the following PSC symptoms having on how you feel and function? Shown here, we see those highest symptom impact from their symptoms and they deserve deeper review and discussion. Why? We highlighted the significance of fatigue. Well, let's look at insomnia. It impacts 63% with 26% describing major impact. Individually, each symptom is painful and distressing. Abdominal and liver pain are affecting more than 40%. Add to that anxiety, itching, depression. And are you surprised? Brain fog. We hear of brain fog with cancer patients but who talks about brain fog affecting PSCers? These symptoms have cumulative and compounding effects. Itching impacts sleep, which impacts fatigue and pain, further increases distress, all of which affect anxiety and depression. The multiplicity of these symptoms are intertwined, cumulative, and can be difficult to separate. You can see the incredible need for robust patient-reported symptom burden measurement tools and better symptom management. Thank you, and back to the studio. Thank you very much, Joanne. One of the goals for the meeting today is that this meeting be as interactive as possible for the patient and caregiver community. So to that end, we, enc we encourage and invite you to participate as much as possible. You can submit online comments at any time. You can find the comment box directly underneath the viewer window, or you can call in during our upcoming live panel discussions. We will also be conducting live polling throughout the day. If you are a PSC patient or a caregiver of a PSC patient, please participate in the live polling. We're going to get started with the first set of polling questions to find out who is with us. Um, in order to go to the online live polling, please scroll to the bottom of the page from which you are viewing this live cast. Click on the green button that says live polling. This will open a new tab in your browser. Alternatively, you can go directly to the website, polev.com slash pscpfdd. You might want to pick up an, a mobile device and, have, and run that separately. So we're gonna get started with our first polls. Uh, can you launch the first question, please? Question one, I am A, a PSC patient, or B, a PSC family, friend, or other caregiver? We're gonna take a few moments to let those responses come in as people find the polling site. So far, it's looking like we're about, well, it's changing. <laughs> we've got a lot of PSC patients and we've got a lot of caregivers here and family members. That's fantastic. Can we um, launch the second question, please? 
Number two, where does the PSC patient live? A, United States, B, Canada, C, Africa, D, Asia Pacific Islands, E, Australia, New Zealand, F, Europe, UK, G, Mexico, Central America, South America, Caribbean Islands, Middle East, H, sorry, Middle East. And it looks like the majority of patients and caregivers in the audience listening at this moment are from the United States. It's about 80% from the United States, 16% Canada. Mm -hmm. That's Next question, kind please. Of what we expected, right? Yeah. Well, we are a U.S.-based organization, and PSC Partners Canada is a North American-based organization. But we are so happy that we have some people joining us from this late hour in Europe. Right. It's quite late there by now. Question three. What is the PSCer's age? A, 17 and under. B, 18 to 39. C, 40 to 59. D, 60 to 79. Or E, 80 and older. Okay. Well, we have uh, a good group of youngsters. Yes, and w people often think of PSC as being a disease that primarily affects middle-aged men. And we're seeing that we've got almost 50%, 18 to 39-year-olds attending mm -hmm. today. We've also got some representing the pediatric population. Yep, so we're look, sitting pretty steady at about 10% pediatric, 50%, 18 to 39, and a third, 40 to 59, and another 13%, 60 to 79. We welcome all of you. We welcome everybody. Thank you Good. so much for being here. Next question, please. Okay, number four. Does the PSC patient identify as A, Male, B, female, C, non-gender conforming or non-binary. And not surprisingly, we're seeing that we have more females in the audience. This is something that um, we see a lot in our survey participation mm -hmm. and registry participation, and we encourage men to uh, make their voices heard as well. But we're very happy that we've got about 43% men today and 56 women, and we have some non-gender conforming non-binary. Very good. Next question, please. Number five, how would the PSC patient describe the journey leading to their PSC diagnosis? Please select one. A, quick and straightforward, B, not too complicated, C, long and complicated, and D, none of the above. Right. It is what we hear so much, don't we, that it is sometimes very long and very complicated to come to the diagnosis. Yes, it, that is, we hear that a lot. And then once a diagnosis is Delivered, sometimes people look back and realize how long they have been suffering with symptoms of PSC. Right. So we're seeing about 40% saying long and complicated, a third not too complicated, and some was quick and straightforward. We'd love to know what the none of the above are. Please yeah. send in your comments. Right, right, right. Okay, number six, please. And this is the last question for this session of live polling. What race best describes the PSC patient? Select up to two. And as we saw from Dr. Bolus's presentation, uh, based on transplant, transplant due to PSC, uh, we would hope to have an equal representation of white identifying patients and black identifying. And this is something we are working on, reaching out to everybody that's mm -hmm. affected by PSC. But in our audience today, it's 80%, 87% white, 
And then we have participation from those who identify as black, Asian, and mixed. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, thank you so much for participating. Uh, we'll come back to live polling later on. Uh, you can leave your polling tab open and simply return to it when we launch the next polling section. Dr. Miller, we are ready to welcome our first Zoom panel and continue this discussion of clinical symptoms of PSC and quality of life with PSC. Great, thank you. So we will I will start off just explaining a little bit to our audience how we will manage this live discussion. This is your time to get your voice in here. And you can do that through online comments and also telephone calls. These will be screened and we will bring as many of you into the discussion as possible. If we don't get to all of your comments, please be assured that they will be included in the patient voice final report. So Elizabeth, we just heard from you a little while ago. So let me start with you. You have had an incredible journey and have had a transplant and have had a recurring PSC. You also really called for hope and for us to all together continue the fight to find a treatment. Tell us a little bit about what it is to have what we call HE for short, but basically is a deep brain fog. What, what is that really like? I think brain fog is the best way to describe it. You know you have a word that you wanna say, but you can't see through the fog and actually grab it. You can't complete that sentence. You know you have the vocabulary to make it succinct, but you just don't have that ability to actually put it into words that you can say. It is reading a really good book and the next day, picking it up to start reading it again and not remembering what was in that chapter you read the day before. It is just not even remembering, you know, birthdays or anything like that, that make your life happy and to just things to look forward to. Um, so it's just that loss of identity and knowing that you can't just be that part of the conversation that you want to be. Right. And that combined with the fatigue. Yes, that is devastating. And that is my biggest worry for the future is I already have significant fatigue. I'm a nurse. It's a busy, busy job. Um, how do I be a nurse, but then also have the brain fog that comes with that, as well as the brain fog with PSC? That is my worry for the future, the day when those two combine and I'm no longer able to function and participate in my dream of being a nurse and giving back to others. Right, right. You have a story about your nephew. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so I have the most fantastic niece and nephew on this planet. Um, they are six and four, and I happen to be 36. And we go on vacation together, and I go to bed at the exact same time as they do. I sleep longer than they do in the morning. And this is devastating. I should be able to stay up with my sister and her husband and my parents and be able to hold conversations after the kids fall asleep. Yet we have the same bedtime as the kids. I am missing so much of life and sleeping it away. And I have no choice because if I push myself, I end up making myself sick. So it is it's trying to fit in all that life has to offer during the day, despite living like a six and a four-year-old. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that very personal story. Tawny, we will go to you next. Hi, I'm Tawny. I'm 41 and I live in Wisconsin. I was diagnosed with PSC and ulcerative colitis when I was 18 years old. And um, some of the biggest challenges I had were hepatic encephalopathy also, um, pyritis and fatigue. Um, but luckily I received 64% of my sister's liver five years ago. So. 
Right. And tell us about the disability and the difficulty, for example, in moving. Um, disability was and is um, really hard to um, was really hard to apply for. I actually applied on my own without my parents even knowing because I was in such a severe state of hepatic encephalopathy. Um, so I was denied the first time and then um, was at the time listed for transplant and was accepted. But it's still an ongoing challenge um, just with being um, trying to get re, uh, re-approved for, tra- for disability as well. Right, it's right. The hard process all around. Right, and you also have arthritis. I do. Um, it's debilitating and painful. Um, we have this saying that when my liver is good, my arthritis is bad. And when my liver is bad, my arthritis is good. Um, it's literally always something. So um, one day I'm able to function and the next day I have to lift my leg into the car or I have excruciating back pain and can't get out of bed. So. Yeah, again, uh, a very personal and, and impactful story about what PSC means for you, specifically, Tawny. Jerome, we will go to you. You're a medical doctor and uh, Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, I uh, had ulcerative colitis starting when I was about 18 or 19, eventually had uh, colon cancer and had a a colectomy. Uh, Then a few years later, I developed PSC and eventually had a transplant. So I've lived um, much of my life, certainly my adult life, dealing with uh, chronic illness of one sort or another. And that sort of got me interested in some of my personal psychological responses. And I was fortunate to get involved with an Mm in-person when it started uh, group, uh, support group, and that's been very valuable to help me and some others. Right. And have you heard the phrase, well, at least you don't have cancer? More than once. I've I've heard all the phrases, and yes, I've heard that phrase uh, also. And for me, uh, my cancer was not symptomatic. It was discovered on a routine colonoscopy because of surveillance for ulcerative colitis. But when I was sick with uh, my worst stages of PSC, I was much sicker than uh, I had ever been, of course, even with the ulcerative colitis, which was pretty bad. Right, and we will come back to you a little bit uh, later as we continue this panel discussion and talk more about the psychosocial implications of this. So Joe, last but definitely not least, we really look forward to hearing from you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Joe. I'm 30 years old and have been living with PSC for about 15 years. For me, the most difficult part about living with it Uh, throughout high school and college and my young work life has been the social impacts and having to be concerned with judgments from others as far as why I'm frequently tired and not able to sleep yet Uh, and then also needing to worry about missing start times for work and knowing that I'm not able to make plans multiple days in a row Mm -hmm. that I'm going to have to have time to rest in between. Otherwise, I'll push myself too hard. Uh, Throughout college, I'd also have to be worried about what professors and teachers would think and sometimes being called out in front of class as to why I'm having to be late or having to rush out to go to the restroom. Uh, I'd also feel like I frequently smelled like poop um, throughout a lot of high school and that always made me not want to go to class or attend social um, events. And mm-hmm. it s- significantly impacted my mental state throughout um, schooling and as a young professional as well. Right. And what about social life? You've already touched about that, on that a little bit, but talk about the difficulties of that during high school and, and college. Yeah, a lot of people, they... Um, in my experience, are not 
they don't really understand that it's not go, go, go all the time mm -hmm. that there is, you can go, but you have to stop and rest and, and that it isn't the fact that I am not a fan of hanging out with a person or whatnot. It's just that I simply physically cannot keep going sometimes. And uh, not everyone can understand that or has understood that rather. Right. And again, talking about the loss of opportunity, and that's been a threat through all of this, uh, starting with Elizabeth and your very poignant way of talking about your school life being taken away from you. I'm sure we have some comments coming in. Mary, will you uh, take us through some of those? We do. Thank you. We have many comments coming in, and we're going to go to the phone lines in a little bit. But uh, so I want to I want to give that number so people can call in if they'd like to call in and, and add their voice. The number to call is 703-844-3231. But for now, I'm just going to read a few comments. And I also want to note that as you all were speaking, the rest of you were often nodding your head. These, these are common experiences. So some of the comments we've got, Catherine from Quebec writes in, I've been experiencing debilitating fatigue bone, muscle pain, IBD, nausea, brain fog, memory loss, itching, vitamin deficiencies, and more. So many sick days, I can no longer work. Until late stage of PSC, we do not even look sick. Mm -hmm. Another comment from Nancy. Anything that would ease the symptoms or level them out so that our daughter could sustain her drive to graduate from college. At least a semester at a time would help tremendously. The two primary symptoms are pruritus and unpredictable intermittent deep fatigue. Right, right. It's that damn unpredictability, right, unpredictability. That, that just keeps going with us. We have a call, uh, a caller that would like to speak as well. Jennifer, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Jennifer, please go ahead. Well, I am. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm from Connecticut, and as a mom, I'm reeling because within the last year, two of my daughters have been recently diagnosed. And they can't say enough. They don't have symptoms at the moment. And I'm really hoping that with this forum and other opportunities, people will bring this to the forefront of their research. These are two girls, they have bright careers, and I hate for moving forward, they can have to worry about all the, um, and have to alter their perception of their future. One's a 26-year-old biomedical product engineer actually working with the, a colon stapler before being diagnosed. The other is a sophomore in college studying to be a physician assistant. With the diagnosis, their future becomes so unpredictable, mm -hmm. like you've been talking about. And my questions that circle through my head at night are, these are my healthy, vibrant, fun, sweet girls, and I can go on and on. But will they be able to have families of their own? Will they be able to, you know, find and keep right. a life partner who will want to carry through the mm -hmm. burden of the disease and its destructive path? So I really, really am fortunate and happy that you are talking to the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies and the clinicians to help those who are still, you know, just learning about the disease. Thank you, Jennifer, for, for those stories. And of course, we wish you and your two daughters all the, the very best. Um, they've already achieved so much. We have another caller, Andy. Andy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, wonderful. Andy, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk a bit about the mental side of things, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, it, it, amazingly enough, turns out having an incurable, untreatable, you know, invisible illness that's, that's life-threatening can be kind of tough to deal with mentally, as I think we've seen in the survey results, too. Right, right, um, right. For me, it it leaves you constantly wondering, uh, like when things are going to go bad. 
right. I'm fairly early on in my PSC journey. I was just diagnosed last year, but it, it's you know you, you you that uncertainty that has has been spoken about. The best mm-hmm. analogy I've found is imagine having a bomb inside you that always only has one second left on the planet. Wow. And that's kind of how it feels when it's, certainly when it's at its worst. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, you know, if people can picture the the mental state you would be in if that was your reality, and that that is the best way I've been able to describe to people what, what it feels like. What a powerful And then power. trying to... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just saying, what a powerful image. Yeah, and it's just, you know, having to live with that, you know, knowing that that, Mm -hmm. you know, metaphorical bomb is inside you. Right. And you just need to learn to live with it and move on. Like, you know, it is what it is. Sometimes it works. Other days, not so well. So, you know, depression, anxiety, panic, I think everyone deals with some level of that, you know, to to varying degrees and certainly seems to coincide with, I mean, early, early on when you're Mm -hmm. first diagnosed and, and certainly as symptoms kind of physical symptoms come and go, I think it puts it more on your mind as well. Right, right. I've gotten better at managing it now, Mm -hmm. but... I mean, I think until there's at least some hope for for treatment to at least slow down progression, I don't know that, you know, that that feeling, that bomb metaphor will ever really go away. Right. And I think that's such a powerful image because although we saw from the survey that some of the symptoms are not there all the time, it's that unpredictability and you just never know. So although you may not have the symptom today, you're not really free of it because you just don't know if it might come back today or not. And that's a story we're exactly. hearing over even, and over. Even the most mon- mundane right. symptoms you feel that anyone else would toss aside and not think twice about right. it. Right, right, right. You're second guessing, like, right. is that PSC related? Is that, you know? So. Right. Right, a constant, a constant companion. Andy, thank you so much for calling in and sharing that, that thank story you. Thank you for and that. that metaphor. Jer- Jerome, would you like to make a comment about that? I'd love to. I'd like to just say two things. In our support group, we've had three women that I remember who uh, have PSC who have gone on to have normal pregnancies and excellent deliveries. Uh, meaning not super, not complicated. So I would say to the caller with the two young uh, daughters that we've seen that. uh, So I would be encouraged by that experience. And for the last caller, he did an amazing job of describing the stages of chronic illness as a loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, He, the disbelief of having such a diagnosis, uh, the anxiety and uncertainty, the depression, but eventually uh, many of us come to some integration and uh, adaptation and that bomb becomes, as we become more and more familiar with the bomb, it becomes less and less potent. It goes from a bomb to a firecracker and eventually just to a small flame. And that, but that unpredictability is is always there and has been mm-hmm. something that plagued me for right. a long time like an axe was always going to fall right. but it's much better it's it gets better over time that is very and good to hear i would hear. just like to add one thing that support support right. groups and personal support are perhaps the most important things you can one can do to help accommodate right. talking with and meeting with others with psc maybe a support group either online or certainly something like PSC Partners. Right. Uh, is just, I just can't overstress how important that right. can be and how helpful. Yeah, I think that is such an important message for all of the audience and everyone that is, that is dealing with that. And of course, PSC Partners is one of those organizations that's very helpful. But also, Jerome, thank you for the support group that you have set up. 
So I think, do we have some more comments that you would like to read, Mary? We do, yes. Um, there's a comment here, an anonymous comment about he hepatic encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy is so scary and dangerous and not, and not known about. It would be great if there was another medication that would help get the toxins out of the body without the severe side effects of diarrhea constantly. And what this, what this uh, comment is about is that the treatment for hepatic encephalopathy is limited and causes constant diarrhea. Um, Tim from Boston who is attending, says, I am very sad to hear people talk about their PSC symptoms. These symptoms dominate my daily life, but it is worse to hear that other people are suffering too. Thank you, Tim. Wow, yeah. We have another caller. So we have uh, Beverly from Mich Michigan. Beverly, are you with us? Hello, how are you all? Fine, thank you. Welcome, Beverly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just have a comment concerning my son. My son is the PSC patient. He's uh, now 34 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but the concern is that I mean, he's had issues with pruritus, and um, but but the main issue that he has now is his weight loss. He mm -hmm. is smaller than he was in high school. He's gone from wow. a size 32 pant to a 29. And he's always been so proud of, you know, how he looks and things like that. And just concerned, I'm, I'm concerned about mentally how um, he feels being that he's so, so skinny and his cheeks are so sunken in. So um, that that's just... Right. I, I, I just, I just wondered if anybody else has an issue with weight loss. Right. Thank you so much, Beverly. And we had heard from Dan, didn't we, talking about how he had lost so much weight as well. Certainly, I think um, so much of the disease can, can lead to weight loss. And um, would one of the panelists like to talk about that as well? in terms of, of just not really being in control of your own weight? Uh, yeah, Elizabeth, please go ahead. I had that exact same issue, especially mm -hmm. when I was diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis and the combination. I didn't fully realize how gaunt and how much almost like a walking skeleton I looked mm -hmm. for this period of time where we were trying to get the hepatitis under control right. with the PSC. Um, I look gaunt and I, I look scary. Right. Um, and it was a matter of just no appetite and you couldn't force yourself to eat. Um, there was no drive. And so it's this constant battle. I had nausea, so I didn't want to eat, but I had to keep eating, which made the nausea worse. And it's just a vicious, vicious cycle. And that was an extremely dark time. And unfortunately, there's no good way to go about it. Right. And again, the importance of finding something that will help with the disease itself rather than these individual symptoms one-on-one, -on -one. although some of the symptom relief, of course, would be so helpful. But basically, um, just that, that whole idea of, of having nausea and, and loss of appetite and all of those things coming in together. We also have another caller. We have Jennifer from Texas, and she is a patient and a physician. So, Jennifer, we really look forward to hearing from you. Hello? Yes, Jennifer. Oh, hello. So, yeah, my name is Jennifer, and I'm from Texas. Um, I was diagnosed, I think, uh, similar to your earlier caller, Andy, about a year ago um, mm -hmm. and was asymptomatic and, and continued to be generally asymptomatic. Um, I'm a radiologist, so I think, um, you know, t echoing what Andy said kind of about the mental toll, um, you know, I know I feel okay, but I can look at my pictures and see that, you know, my liver and my bile ducts look not okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, I think, a lot of stress having been a physician and cared for liver patients, you know, when I was in training and, and knowing kind of what 
might be you know, the inevitable outcome mm-hmm. when the disease progression is about 10 years. And, and there's a lot of mental toll that goes with that and kind of, as he said, I think waiting for the next shoe to drop. Right. Um, and, you know, I have young kids as well. So, you know, deciding not to tell them because I don't want them to be stressed and concerned about something that, you know, is at least not physically manifesting mm-hmm. for me now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. So. Well, thank you so much for calling in, Jennifer. Do we have some more comments that came in online? Mary, would you like to share some of those? We do. Um, we have people writing in from all over the world. Um, Cindy from Israel says, we have lost too many people along the years to PSC. A cure has to be found. Living with symptoms of itching, fatigue are not understood. New medications could help so much to improve quality of life for PSCers. Brett from Wisconsin, who is a patient, wrote, PSC has impacted every aspect of my life. The symptoms? make some days impossible to function with a clear mind and full energy. There are many days when I don't even have the energy to go on a simple walk with my wife and son. PSC affects everyone differently, and you don't need to have PSC to be affected by the disease. Right, right, right. Joe, um, what do you say to that? Well, I can't speak personally as to what the caregivers in my life feel, but uh, I I certainly have many times and and still feel like I'm missing out on things because of trying to manage symptoms or just simply not feeling like I have enough energy to do something. And, And there's been many times that I've felt left out of whether it's socially or mm-hmm. uh, uh, with my family uh, and, or with my job, there's, uh, it never really ends. <laughs> right. And Tawny? Yeah, I wanted to definitely raise my hand to answer that one too. Um, I have a large family and it's definitely affected each one of my family members. Um, when I was living in Illinois, my sister was always there and I was at her house every weekend. Um, And then when I moved to Wisconsin, my other sister was there and she even came down um, to Illinois when I needed her one weekend. And my parents have been there since day one um, and just always being there. Um, Whether it's every single appointment, still they'll go on appointments with me. Um, But even to my little nieces and nephews, they used to bring my luggage upstairs when I would visit. So they only knew me as um, not feeling well and being just exhausted all the time Um, and even reminding me of things when I was dealing with HE. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it affects the, not just the person, but the entire family. Right. Even friends too, like Joe has said. Right, right. And we have another caller. It's Marianne from New Jersey. And she also wants to talk about the diagnosis and the impact on family. So, uh, Marianne, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi, how are you doing? I wanted to talk about uh, when you get the initial diagnosis. My son received the initial diagnosis about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. He was going about a week before he was going into his second year of college. He had lost about 50 pounds and... Wow. uh, when he received the diagnosis, he almost didn't want to go back to school. And we talked to him about going back to school and, uh, you know, just continue. He had a difficult year the first year when he was back in school, just dealing with the diagnosis and dealing with the having the liver enzymes elevated and just the mm-hmm. support to the disease process. But as time went on, he was able to deal a little bit more with the disease. He has a PSC and the autoimmune hepatitis. And 10 years later, he's uh, uh, working full-time and just dealing with the disease itself. And we've learned to enjoy right. uh, just the simple things in life of enjoying just having birthdays together and seeing each other. If he comes over with us, if he has fatigue, 
just being with being together with each other just having uh, right we're just happy doing that right and I'm sure it just means so much to him that you're there for him and that you can share these moments together maybe I'll go back to you Elizabeth you went to school after you had your transplant and you had that period of of um, lots of energy and catch as you I think the way you said it was you really started to catch up on everything you had missed talk a little bit about the difference between um, before transplant and after transplant uh, to be honest I did not really have a freshman or sophomore year of high school mm -hmm. um, I was sick continuously I could not be part of it I missed the high school dances I missed being at any high school events, the football games, anything like that. And then immediately after the transplant, I was trying to catch up with my education. So I lost all of these important milestones mm -hmm. in one's life that, and just the ability to socialize and learn the group dynamics of life. And then I all of a sudden had energy. I was running around. And it was this whole new world. And how do you keep on task when all of a sudden this world seems bright and happy and unbelievable, like you have everything in your grasp? And it was such a difference. But it was also then playing catch up academically, socially, developmentally from being completely excused from life during these pivotal moments. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that took many years to even out. And it's something that I hope nobody has to do for themselves because it's devastating to all of a sudden have to play catch up in the prime of your life. Right, right. How difficult to have that, that wonderful experience and yet feel that you're living on borrowed time. And wouldn't it be nice if there was more than a transplant that, that could help you? That, you know, people might think, oh, she got a transplant, she did so well, but would you wish a transplant on anyone, just a procedure itself? No, um, and I had a fantastic transplant. Um, experience. But I think what people fail to realize is a transplant is not a cure. Mm -hmm. It's trading one set of problems for another. Right. You have these symptoms before, but this, the immunosuppression after a transplant is nasty stuff. It's tremors, it's migraines, it's debilitating in its own way. Right. And it's, I was, a, I'm a nurse. How do I give an injection if I can't keep my hand steady due to immunosuppression? Right. So a transplant does not mean life is perfect. A transplant means you just have more time, but you still have struggles. Right. That is so important to remember that. And Tawny, you'd like to chime in? Yeah, I wouldn't wish a transplant on anybody either if they didn't have to go through it. I had several infections post-transplant and was admitted five different times um, after my transplant. And, um, but trying to prevent reoccurring PSC is, I'll be on um, not only the anti-rejection meds, but prednisone for the rest of my life, right. trying to prevent reoccurring PSC. And that's, that's just a scare in itself. Um, you know, hoping and praying that I don't get reoccurring PSC like so many of my friends have. Right, right, right. Uh, Jerome? I would just like to sort of tell the other side. Uh, my transplant, and I had it when I was uh, 68 or 69 years old, and I was in the hospital for five days. I had a few early complications, but I have no side effects. I'm very fortunate, but I have no side effects from my immunosuppressive drugs, and I have a return to uh, pretty much normal. Uh, so I feel very fortunate in that way, but there is a, there are some, I was very fortunate to have a very smooth post-transplant mm -hmm, mm -hmm. course. So it's not always, it's also unpredictable as right. this disease. It just adds to the unpredictability and we're so happy that yours was as smooth oh, as, as it right. was. So that is very nice. 
So we have uh, some more time left. Do, do we have more comments from you, Mary? We do. In fact, there's a couple here that um, are talking about the difficulties with education for young people. Mm -hmm. Nancy um, says, anything that would ease the symptoms or level them out so that our daughter could sustain her drive to graduate from college at least a semester at a time would help tremendously. The two primary symptoms are pruritus and unpredictable intermittent deep fatigue. Mm -hmm. Another comment here from Reggie in Connecticut. This is about worry. Our son was diagnosed with PSC 22 years ago and had a transplant nine years ago. This summer, PSC made its ugly presence known once again. Third hospitalization in three weeks. He is very, very ill and needs another transplant. Worry is a constant companion, but so is hope. Great. And then one more, Kara from Michigan. She says, my 23-year-old son has been hospitalized 15 times. He nearly missed his college graduation and was released from the hospital in time to walk across the stage and receive his degree with honors. PSC is an emotional and physical roller coaster. Right, what a, what a story uh, we have there. Jerome? PSC Partners has a wonderful website with a lot of information for caregivers mm -hmm. and especially caregivers with younger children. And each year we do uh, some workshop breakouts at our annual meeting to discuss caregivers and their difficulty because as we can see, this is a family illness. It is not just the person who right. has the illness. Right, right, right. It really affects the family and, and really the whole social environment that each uh, PSC patient is in, uh, your work colleagues, your, your friends, et cetera. So um, let us come back uh, to, um, to another comment, Mary? Or, yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so around the idea that of awareness, Linda from Idaho writes in, living with PSC is so frustrating as few doctors are familiar with it. Mm -hmm. I was told when I was originally diagnosed, the doctor couldn't do anything for me until I turned yellow. When I questioned a doctor regarding ERCP, my husband told me I came across as arrogant just because I was questioning him. Mm. It's just frustrating living with an unseen and unknown disease. Right, right, right. Joe, well, let's come back to you um, in our last, uh, last few minutes here. And tell us a little bit about your diagnostic journey and how that was. And, and um, were that, was that one of the long and complicated ones or did you have a fairly straightforward path? No, I'd say it wasn't straightforward and it was pretty long as well. I was a sophomore in high school and all of a sudden I was so sick and unable to attend classes, not even once per week. And I would be having at least 12 bowel movements per day, Wow, about 20 pounds in about two weeks. Um, there was, it was this very quick onset of symptoms and uh, it took, I don't remember exactly, but I believe it was at least six months between the onset of symptoms to between the time when we finally began to get starting to get mm -hmm. answers as far as what it was. And even then it was, you know, one diagnosis for the ulcerative colitis and then it still took time for the PSC diagnosis afterwards. Right, right, right. So one of the things we really want to stress today is we need treatments, but we also need new, uh, we need better diagnostic markers so that the diagnosis can be less invasive and we can get to that diagnosis faster. PSC Partners has been successful in getting the ICD code for PSC, which I think will uh, at least document the diagnosis more efficiently so that we can get a clearer picture of how many people and who has PSC in this country. But it's still taking too long. It's taking too many patients too long to get there and really understand 
the disease that they have, and you can imagine uh, what that is like for parents and other family members who, who are affected by this if, if the patient is young. And of course, you know, just any adult going through that, how frustrating that, that is, as we heard so well from Ricky earlier today, that it's, it's basically, you are the patient, but you also have to educate your caregivers, your, your, you know, your clinical caregivers. So we need both treatments, but we need better diagnostics to diagnose. And then we also really want biomarkers that tell us when the treatment is successful so that we know sooner whether a drug might actually really work. So these are all things that, that come together as we think about developing new treatments for, for this disease. So that's why I'm, I kind of really want to also talk a little bit about the diagnosis part itself. And um, Elizabeth, did you want to talk a little bit about your own diagnosis and, and what could have, you know, what if it had been a blood test and, and you could have, or and just a, an image or something? Well, my diagnosis was very long and arduous. I started with symptoms at the age of one and a half and it took to the age of nine right. for a diagnosis. Um, I My body compensates very well. And by the time my liver numbers actually rose, and they found via ERCP significant liver damage already. Mm -hmm. um, and I had severe abdominal pain where I would roll around in the floor and my parents couldn't touch me. Um, I had feeding intolerances and NG tubes. I had vomiting. I had all of these things and we knew something was wrong. But because my liver did not, my LFTs did not rise until I was nine, we were stuck. Mm -hmm. And then to find the diagnosis and find that I was already really far into it um, with severe damage was devastating. Um, but it was really long. And I don't know how my parents quite did that. It was multiple centers throughout the East Coast before I got my diagnosis. Right, right, right. And, and um, one of the things about the liver is that it is very plastic, it's very adaptable, it can regenerate, which is a benefit, but it also tricks you then, doesn't it? Because like you it, say, it didn't really tell you or your parents or your doctors that, hey, there's a real problem here that, that we need to be looking at. So this has been an amazing panel discussion uh, to kick us off in our first live session. We can't thank you enough for having joined us, Jerome, Tawny, Elizabeth, and Joe. We wish you all the very best for the rest of the day, and we will now then move on to our next session. Thank you so much, all of you. Bye-bye.